proposing it to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, you say, I'm going to vote against this because I think it's bad for my constituents. I think it's bad for the country. And just as importantly, I think it's inconsistent with the principles that we ran on and that we're supposed to be representing as conservatives or as liberals or NDP or whatever you're bringing to the table. And so if you're not electing people who have that strength of character, then of course you're going to have a power vacuum and the leadership of the political parties is going to um, move into uh, into that, that vacuum. But it's it's not a systemic problem. It's a character problem. Yeah, you know, and this goes back to the whole ethics thing that we talked about earlier. Uh, it's a demonstration of our lack of character because we need these, We uh, at least somebody feels that we need these uh, ethics commissioners uh, to watch over the people that we elect. And we elect them based on trust. Uh, we elect them based on the fact that we want, we expect them to follow through on the things that we don't, uh, that, you know, they say they're going to do. It's one of the reasons why voter turnout fluctuates. Uh, and usually it goes down over time because people see that uh, the politicians in question uh, will go back to wherever they came from if they're incumbents or when they get there, all of a sudden they'll change. And people are scratching their health head going, what happened? On the campaign trail, he said X, Y, Z. And now what we've got is he's towing the party line. And there's plenty of examples of that, of that. Young MPs being manipulated behind the scenes, or MPPs perhaps, um, you know, or others who are saying whatever they need to say to get elected, and people just get tired of that, and they don't want to be led down the garden path again. And so, you know, there's this trend away from, ah, what the point? They get people get the attitude, and justifiably so in, in a lot of cases. What's the point of voting? They're not going to do what they say they're going to do anyway. I get that frustration. I get that. I feel it sometimes, you know, although I still think that voting is always worthwhile, no matter what anybody tells you. Um, yeah, you understand the just, frustration. Yeah, of course. I, I understand. Because sure. I feel as frustrated as they, as they do. Uh, I want to see good government. I want decent people in office. I want, you know, to make sure that when we elect John Jones or Mary Brown, whoever that happens to be, for a particular position, they're going to follow through and do it the way that we would. Yeah, and, you know, a good real-world example of this, again, using Canada as an example, uh, it was the whole SNC-Lavalin scandal uh, that uh -huh. went on before the last election. And, you know, we talk a lot about investigations and we talk a lot about ethics commissions and ethics commissioners and all of these things, okay? But who's really responsible for policing the behavior of the prime minister and the behavior of cabinet members, ultimately? Is it an ethics officer that's supposed to be quote-unquote neutral? The answer is no. The The organization, the people that have a duty to police the behavior of the Prime Minister are first and foremost members of the cabinet and in the event that the members of, of that members of the cabinet are collectively acting unethically or covering up the unethical behavior of the Prime Minister, then it's members of the caucus of the governing party, the backbenchers who have the obligation to hold those people accountable. That's the way our system is supposed to work. And ultimately, it's not a failure of our system that Justin Trudeau and his cohorts got away with some of the behavior that they were involved with. It's the responsibility, it's the fault of, of the people who have been elected who are wishy-washy, wimpy sissies, okay, pandering dandies, <laughs> pandering dandies, as I like to call them, who are more concerned uh, ab about, well, you know, I can't vote against the prime minister in my caucus, and I can't vote against them in the House of Commons. I might lose my position. 
or he won't sign my papers or whatever. And my answer to that is, okay, well, so be it. Stand up for what you believe in. We have to be able to police ourselves in the political system. Um, and, and, and we're not doing it. And the reason we're not doing it is because voters are not ensuring whether they're and, and, and it even goes further down the line, not just voters in a general election, but but members of the party, local constituency associations, who are not ensuring that the candidates that they're voting for, that they're putting forward for election to parliament, that they're nominating, are of sound, strong character, and strong integrity, first and foremost, okay, it's the prime minister is not supposed to be the president in our system. The prime minister is supposed to be the first amongst equals. And you know, if yeah. you you sure you're going to run into controversies from time to time. Yes, you're going to support your prime minister. Yes, you're going to support your your party uh, and your colleagues in your party. But that's not a blank check that can be cashed any time by the prime minister or by members of the cabinet. They have an obligation to act in a certain way, and if they're not acting in a certain way, if they're acting unethically, if they're being dishonest, or if they're just simply bad, serving the country badly, then you have an obligation as a backbencher to stand up and hold them accountable. And if you're, if you're not doing it, then we as voters, whether we're in the general electorate or we're members of a political party, we have an obligation to, pardon me, to ensure to vote those people out and to ensure that the people that are getting nominated to act as our representative have the integrity to act accordingly if they're faced with those decisions. So what you're really saying in a rather eloquent way is that we are our, we are our own last line of defense well that sure if no one else will hold these people accountable including backbenchers and or the caucus or whoever it is uh then we should so when someone lies to us and i can think of several examples in the last 20 30 years where that's happened where they've blatantly lied to us knowing there was no either they couldn't keep the promise or they had no intention of keeping it some went so far as to sign documents on you know, on public TV um, saying, you know, they would never engage in this particular policy. And the first thing they did when they got elected was pass a law that's, that strike that policy down and then reverse the policy they said they'd never reverse. OK, well, you know, that's to me almost about as serious an ethical breach as one can commit short of killing somebody. No. That's a, um, that's an interesting topic that you brought. Or not the, not the killing people. That's not interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, say what you will um, about Sheila Copps. And by the way, when when Kretsch, we're going back a few years now. But when Jean Kretsch was elected, part of what he was elected on was a, a major plank in the liberal platform in that general election. When when Jean Kretsch was first elected, um, when the liberals were first elected to government, and Kretsch became the, the prime GST. minister was to repeal the GST, and of course, they, they didn't do that. Uh, and over the during the election campaign, Sheila Copps said, you know, if we don't repeal the GST, you can trust us. If we don't, I'm going to resign. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, she didn't really mean that. But when they didn't repeal this GST, she ended up being sort of caught by her own words. So give credit where it's due. Eventually, she did resign. There was a by-election, and her constituents, her, her riding, re-elected her. Um, and uh, it's the first time that I'm aware of that something like that happened. The only time that I'm aware of where something as stark as that happened, where, where a, a, a member of the government uh, actually resigned over something like this and then you know ran in a subsequent by-election and got re-elected. So, you know, I give Sheila Copps, I, there are lots of things that I don't see eye to eye uh, and haven't ever with Sheila Copps, but give her, you know, at least that that credit where it's due. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, you know, you're well, the story. I would you go ahead, Nick. 
going to say the people, the, the situation I was thinking of was Dalton McGinty uh, when he won his first election, promised that he would never raise taxes. He and he signed that pledge on TV in front of millions of people from Ontario. Uh, that, you know, don't you worry, we're not going to raise taxes without a, without a referendum. And he signed a pledge to that fact. So the first thing he did after he got elected was to strike down, yeah. uh, you know, rip up that, that agreement and then strike down the law that prevented him from doing it without a referendum. He blatantly, he blatantly lied. It's the most egregious one I can think of. And there have been plenty you could draw from, especially during that era. But the bottom line is he never should have seen the inside of that office after the next election. Ontario, as a, you know, should have risen up in righteous anger and, and fired him at the next election. Well, his, because his own backbenchers should have risen up against him. Yeah. But it, like I said before, uh, what you, when you were talking about the, you know, the different people who can hold Government's accountable. We are our own best last defense. Agreed. Uh, so if they won't do it, we certainly should have. Ultimately, as as uh, Ronald Reagan or somebody said once, the buck stops here. <laughs> and that was a sign. I got on, the guy. That was a sign on President Truman's desk. Do, okay, that's right. I knew it was a president. I just I couldn't I couldn't remember which one it was. But the bottom line is that with for us. We, we've been talking all night about, on and off all night, about the idea of ethics commissioners. Well, there are no better ethics commissioners than the voting public. And if we don't like what's going on in the city council, then we should fire those at the ballot box the next time it comes up. Not reelect them because, oh, well, he did me a favor and I got my passport faster. Okay. Amen to that, brother. And with that, we're going to go for another uh, quick break. We're coming to the top of the hour here on the Nick and Joe Show on thinkradio.ca. So we'll catch you guys in the live broadcast on the other side of the break. And if you're listening to the podcast, we will catch you in segment number three on Monday morning. And we're going to carry on this conversation. We've got plenty of meat to sink our teeth into in the next segment because we're going to talk about Ontario politics. And boy, oh boy, uh, things going to heat up, I'm going to tell you. So you don't want to miss that. So stay with us if you're in the live show, and if you're in the listening to us in the podcast, make sure you catch us on segment number three on uh, Monday morning. <laughs> 